In light of recent diplomatic contact between the United States and Iran, Book TV presents portions of author talks that examine negotiations between the two countries over the past 30 years. In the next hour, you'll see clips with U.S. Central Command Advisor David Christ, author of The Twilight War, Abraham Sofer, former legal advisor to the State Department and author of Taking on Iran, and Trita Parsi, president of the National Iranian American Council and author of A Single Roll of the Dice. We start with David Christ, author of The Twilight War, The Secret History of America's 30-Year Conflict with Iran. Mr. Christ sits down with former National Security Council official Ellen Lepson to discuss internal debates within the American military and government over relations with Iran. There are debates within the military as be in addition to between militaries and civilians in our government on you know how to manage this Iran problem. How do we act in a way that sends clear signals to the Iranians about our red lines and our limits without being so confrontational that the only option is to escalate uh, mm -hmm. military tensions. I thought your book had some really um, original material on some of these debates within the military. And I wonder if you could um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, CENTCOM is out in the, in the arena, in the, mm -hmm. in the theater itself, and the folks back in Washington are part of a conversation between civilian and military f people trying to set the course of, of U.S. policy. Uh, there were a few stories about you know, s when that really creates some friction that I think are, are quite interesting. You, you told a story that I think you knew quite vividly from the time that your father served as a CENTCOM commander of, um, this was the late 80s, I believe, uh, between the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and uh, the admiral that was in the region, um, and at the time that your, right. I think the admiral was responsible for naval forces in the Gulf when your father was the CENTCOM commander. Um, help us sort of understand why that story was important to the U.S.-Iran story you're telling. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating story, and it's a, it, as you say, it illustrates the fact that there is not a uniform view within the military, let alone the U.S. government, of how to approach Iran. Uh, the issue was uh, really between, uh, there was an admiral by the name of uh, James Ace Lyons. He uh, was described to me by the chief of naval operations at the time as the most uh, insubordinate man he'd ever known, mm -hmm. um, but also uh, grudgingly uh, a, a great thinker, one of those people who really thinks outside the box, to use an overused uh, metaphor. Um, and, uh, but Lyons never had gotten over the, uh, the bombing of the U.S. Marine barracks. He saw Iran with very good reason as complicit in that, and they, we had not responded to it. So he was advocating not only a, a very strident military uh, uh, policy, but actual military strikes against the Iranians um, at, at the time. He was encouraged by Admiral Crow. He and Crow had a long relationship. Uh, Crow was a very political military officer. Uh, he used to use lines for uh, a lot of his dirty work, for lack of a better word, or to do things that he didn't necessarily want to be associated with. Um, and this was an, a case where, where the Admiral really encouraged Lyons in what he termed a window of opportunity plan, which was uh, uh, in August 87, there was a turnover of aircraft carriers out in the Gulf, and Lyons wanted to use this plus a battleship that was about to arrive uh, to really punish the Iranians. Um, perhaps even use it as a, uh, a way of ushering in regime change with, with regime level targets, not just military. On the other side of this was uh, 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 the CENTCOM commander, my father, and, uh, and pretty much supported by Caspar Weinberger, very much so, uh, and the civilians in the, the Pentagon, if you will, outside the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who uh, thought the answer with the Iranians was more of a containment view and that we don't want to escalate this crisis. Um, if they do something, we'll do uh, uh, sort of a restrained measure operation. We wouldn't avoid striking the Iranian mainland with the object of trying to keep this crisis in check so it doesn't go to a full-blown war. So we would essentially drive the Iranians back by seizing oil platforms and things like that without escalating the conflict. So if they mine or do something provocative, uh, we'd re respond proportionally. And these two views really clashed within the Pentagon. Um, and uh, and what happens is 
uh, a series of events happen, these carrier deployments that Lions does. It eventually uh, gets to the Secretary of uh, Defense Weinberger's attention, uh, who essentially sides with those who thinks Lions has been insubordinate, and he, and he fires them, uh, relieves them. Um, and in the middle of all this, Admiral Corral, who was the guy who had privately encouraged him, and the, and the transcripts of the phone conversations between Lyons and Crow are quite convincing, uh, had encouraged Lyons the entire time in this sort of uh, surreptitious military operation, um, doesn't back him up, and he says, I, I know nothing. And uh, so Lyons takes the fall for something mm -hmm. the chairman had actually encouraged. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and then, um, so let's imagine the position of a more lower ranking military officer in mm -hmm. the Gulf. If you're serving on one of the ships that's based out of one of the countries in the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, you understand kind of in the abstract that Iran is perhaps the largest threat, uh, largest piece of the threat environment. It's no mm -hmm. longer the Soviet Union or the Russians. We're not worried about the Chinese, at least yet. <laughs> we might be worried about Somali pirates, but in the big scheme of things, uh, Iran looms the largest as a as a possible air, uh, you know military requirement. How does the the more junior military personnel? How do they understand U.S. policy? Do they? You know, let's just take a snapshot of something fairly recent. Mm -hmm. um, do they believe that you know if you're deployed for two or three years to to the Gulf region? Do you think that our young military officers? Uh, you know, do see Iran as the enemy, or, or how do you think they are conditioned uh, to understand U.S. policy? And I guess it would also help to understand, uh, you know, how often is somebody who's forward deployed in one of the branches of the armed services, how often do they get briefed on U.S. policy? How do they get the kind of nuances right of when we're supposed to be forward leaning and when we're supposed to be <laughs> just kind of maintaining and containing? Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's a, a good question. I'm not sure that sometimes even the senior officers have that same nuanced view. Iran mm -hmm. is such a, a difficult problem with, a, as I described, sort of this relationship between peace and war, between light or darkness. It's not an easy, it's not an easy, it's not quite clearly, in the, the, say, in the Cold mm -hmm. War where we knew the Soviet Union were the adversary and everybody sort of approached it that way. Iran's different. I would say your average sailor uh, um, probably doesn't have a good uh, view of this, this nuanced view. Um, a lot of them, it's based upon their interaction with the Iranians themselves when they pass them on, on the water, which is in some cases very professional. Other cases with the Revolutionary Guard, they're very nervous. Um, it's, uh, I, 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 the U.S. military does, a, I think, a very good job trying to condition ships and, and uh, because we're really talking naval issues are the most likely mm -hmm. issue, not Army or, or Air Force but ships before they deploy, a series of uh, um, uh, workups to, to kind of put them in this mindset of, okay, is this boat hostile? Isn't it hostile? Is it mm -hmm. a smuggler? Is it a Revolutionary Guard boat? Does he really mean, uh, is he really just out there to tweak your nose and not really start a war uh, or not? So we try very hard to get them, uh, people conditioned to this environment. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it is a tricky situation. There's just no doubt about it. It's. Uh, and with no diplomatic relations, uh, last year, um, at least according to the, the press accounts, the Supreme Leader rejected an opening of a hotline between our two navies, which would have perhaps helped diffuse this problem. If there was an incident, we could quickly call a commander and bond or a boss and say, hey, we didn't, we, this is what we saw. That's what's called the Incidents at Sea Agreement that I know several of the naval co U.S. naval commanders in the region have thought would be uh, sort of below the threshold of a big political right. breakthrough, but but still something very useful and pragmatic. A absolutely, yeah. and I think if we could get to at least that step, it right. would be it would help. And Igrin doesn't have anything to do with the uh, the grand geostrategic calculations or mm -hmm. lay the governments view each other. It's uh, we did it with the Soviet Union when there was tremendous adversary. And it's something navies do. It's yeah. uh, it's wealth in keeping. I think mm -hmm. with both of them. I, I think the reference to the Cold War is useful, and we'll eventually get to this. How do you know Twilight War, <laughs> Shadow War, Cold War? You know how do we uh, understand this U.S. Iran uh, story? And um, the Cold War, in some ways, I think, is a useful analogy because there's pieces of this relationship that have that kind of coercive, set the limits, signal each other, don't go any farther, et cetera.